so good afternoon uh, i hope all of you are doing well and uh, keeping yourself safe uh, this afternoon i am going to take up uh, a continental shelf exclusive economic zone uh, and uh, if time permits then i will also take up high seas uh, students maritime areas i have told you about different maritime areas at least five maritime areas i i wanted to discuss with you the first was territorial waters the second was contiguous zone both these maritime zones i have already discussed uh, this afternoon what i am going to deal with i am going to deal with the next maritime zone which is not only important as a maritime zone but also it is important for your exams uh, in the exam you can expect a full question from this topic as well uh, so continental shelf is the third maritime area and you must try to understand what is the meaning of continental shelf look at this map if you look and look at this map uh, you you may find that uh, in this map you will find that uh, you see this is the bed uh, of the ocean you know this is called sea bed uh, or the ocean floor right and so and uh, i have already told you about the territorial sea and this contiguous zone uh, this afternoon what i am going to deal with is this continental shelf you look at this this is the base of the ocean or the sea the floor of the ocean so uh, like we say what is where is our bed where we lie down so likewise this is the floor of the ocean where the sea uh, has all the resources you see in the in the this ocean beneath this ocean floor or on the sedimentation on the ocean floor that is continental shelf but the question is what is the meaning of continental shelf uh, because this is also important to be understood as if you do not know the meaning because generally uh, the geological and geographical meaning of continental shelf is different than the legal concept so uh, we have to first of all try to understand that what is the legal uh, concept of uh, continental shelf you look at this uh, geological concept of shelf is uh, the geographical one where shelf is i generally tell my students that uh, shelf the common meaning of shelf is where something if some something you uh, put uh, at a place and it will not fall down so this is called shelf where somebody can take rest so if you like the examples of uh, shelves can be a bookshelf so bookshelf is the place where you can put the, your books and it will not fall down so this is the kind of so the thing is that shelf is uh, where the sediments in the ocean that will not be uh, going down so that is the so where it will happen so it will happen near the coast so where the depth is not very very deep uh, so this is the geographical concept of shelf uh, uh, but the legal concept of shelf is different you see there suppose if i have just drawn this uh, uh, this map so up to this point you see uh, up from this point uh, and left leftwards this is the uh, this is the territorial uh, uh, territorial uh, uh, landed landed territory this is landed territory and from there onwards you see that this is from here onwards what you will find that this is the whole ocean and so from from this point towards right this is ocean and uh, uh, if you go down i am i am just drawing this this line to uh, tell you that it 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 gives you an impression that uh, this is this represents ocean floor or sea bed so if this is sea bed so you see that uh, the depth here is very very uh, less so it's not very deep but if you go from this point again further then there is a kind of slope so this slope is having greater gradient a greater slope so here there is a possibility that that sedimentation or something will fall down more easily and from here this point is 
the point where continental slope uh, that comes to an end and thereafter there is a different geological formation which is kind of rise rising of the slope so here again so up to this point what will happen that so suppose if sedimentation will uh, the sedimentation which is coming from the rivers and drains and different uh, uh, water bodies they are coming from here and going uh, into the sea then sedimentation will fall down and up to the continental shelf geographical continental shelf uh, it will be uh, uh, deposited but after that suppose if some sedimentation is going beyond this point then it will fall down the slope because there is a higher gradient here and from there it will go up to uh, this uh, rise and here again you will find sedimentation so you see that uh, why i am going to tell you about these concepts because what happened that uh, there was a time uh, before this uh, uh, half of the 20th century uh, that uh, no nation uh, went far beyond their geographical continental shelf to exploit uh, the natural resources which are beneath the ocean floor uh, but after the advancement in science and technology what happened that uh, uh, some of the nations they started uh, to exploit or they wanted to exploit the resources beyond this smaller geographical concept of continental shelf and the first lead was taken by uh, so uh, the first lead was, was taken by uh, the president of united states his name was president harry truman and he declared in 1945 september 1945 what he declared he declared that united states uh, wants to proclaim a 200 meter isobath in the ocean uh, so that will be dependent upon the depth isobath is a word which is used in geography isobath so in the ocean 200 meter of depth that will be up to that point uh, truman declared that uh, us wants to exploit uh, the natural resources which are found beneath the ocean floor now from that you know even 200 meter depth is considered a great depth uh, if you some of you might have uh, the experience of a scuba diving in the ocean then you will find that how much pressure it is uh, when you take a dive up to maybe that uh, maybe that uh, 30 meters so even 30 meters deep is you know very difficult to go down and then uh, you know uh, exploit and explore the resources which are beneath the ocean floor uh, so what to say about 200 meter so in those times in 1945 afterwards what happened that united states was trying to claim 200 meter depth so it was also considered a big jump in the in the ambitions of the developed countries however uh, if you uh, move further just in uh, uh, a decade or thereafter, in 1958, when the uh, next uh, convention that was agreed on continental shelf, uh, so in that convention, if you look at this convention, 1958 con convention, you'll find that one more uh, criteria was laid down to exploit the resources of continental shelf. Apart from the isobath test, the other criteria was exploitability test. What is the meaning of exploitability? That if a country has the scientific know-how that how can it go for the exploitation of natural resources which are even beyond 200 uh, meters of depth in that case that country may be allowed because it has the means of exploiting the natural resources even beyond 200 meters of depth of in the sea in the sea so uh, you see that there has been a gradual movement in the ambition of the nations to go for and go uh, to exploit the resources which can be found in the seabed and seabed is having a lot of resources uh, uh, talk of uh, oil talk of gas uh, discuss about uh, maybe that uh, uh, many other uh, minerals like i have told you potato shaped minerals uh, nickel magnesium all these are there in the uh, seabed so uh, nations have been going on and on to do and try, try to get it uh, even from the ocean floor and therefore what happened that when the next uh, 
the, the next third United Nations Convention that was to be agreed. And I have told you in the uh, other lecture that and the process started in 1973 itself in Venezuela. Uh, and this process went on for eight long years. And this uh, process ultimately finalized in 1982 when we have now the UN Convention on Law of Sea. In, the, that, in those uh, six, uh, seven, eight years, uh, what you will find that you'll, you'll find that many nations, they wanted more and more. What I say sometimes to you, you may remember that Yedil Mange more. Likewise, you know, nations have been trying to get more and more out of uh, the sea also because uh, there is a, uh, there is a, uh, you know, sca scarcity of resources over the landed territories. And therefore what happened that in, when the UN Convention Law of the Sea 1982 was going to be negotiated during the whole uh, late 70s and early 80s, at that moment of time, a new set of, you know, ambitions came forward. And now what happened that uh, the, the UN Convention in that negotiators wanted more and you'll find that now the breadth of the continental shelf if you find if you go and look in uh, look in the uh, the un convention i will just show you uh, the un convention uh, and then you will find that uh, this un convention is a very very important convention and you find here that what it says that the continental shelf is uh, going up to a distance of 200 nautical miles from the baselines from which the breadth of the territorial sea is measured, where the outer edge of the continental margin does not extend up to that distance. Now, what is that? Uh, so I, I want to just, uh, first of all, I will just uh, try to make you understand each and every word of this paragraph first uh, of Article 76 of UN Convention on the law of the sea. What is this paragraph first? It says, what is the meaning of continental shelf? It says that the continental shelf of a coastal state comprises the seabed and subsoil. What is the meaning of subsoil? Subsoil means the sedimentation, the whole you know, thickness of sedimentation. So subsoil of the submarine areas and it also, subsoil also includes the rock, the formation of rock. So for rock and then beneath the rock. The so sea bed and subsoil of the submarine areas means that the, the bed of the ocean floor and thereafter beneath it. So maybe sedimentation and even deeper inside. That extends beyond its territorial sea throughout the natural prolongation of its land territory to the outer edge of the continental margin. Now, what is this continental margin? I told you, if you again, I, I'll, I'll show you this one. Uh, continental margin. What is this continental margin? This is the continental margin. Legal, legal concept. What is the legal concept of continental shelf? It is shelf. So this is shelf. And then this is slope. This is slope, slope. And then rise. So up to this rise. So up to this point, this is called the legal concept of continental shelf. So shelf plus slope plus rise is the legal concept of continental shelf. In short, you can remember it as a uh, name, uh, name of a cultural organization, which is RSS, Rastriya Swayamsevaksam, but it's not Rastriya Swayamsevaksam, but it is a rise plus slope plus shelf. That is called continental shelf, legal concept of continental shelf. So you see that up to this point, so what is the legal concept of continental shelf is called continental margin in geography. So in geography, so that geographical term is used here. When you see this one, that continental shelf comprises uh, the seabed and subsoil that extend beyond its territorial sea throughout where to the natural prolongation of its land territory to the outer edge of the continental margin. So continental margin means what? Continental margin means shelf plus slope plus rise. And then you might have found that uh, the next set of words, which is natural prolongation of its land territory. Now, why these words are uh, used? Because I will just uh, try to make you understand about uh, the, the relevance of these words. Because normally what happens that suppose if you just understand continental shelf geographically, you will understand that, okay, up to this much of depth in the ocean. 
but uh, you know uh, when truman proclaimed that isobath test and thereafter when the uh, negotiations uh, on this third un conference on the law of sea that was going on at that moment of time the nations wanted more and they wanted even 200 nautical miles like that so how could they justify uh, the the extension of their claims in the seabed and therefore you know the theories were explored and one of the theory which found support uh, amongst all the nations was that uh, uh, that what is the meaning of continental shelf shelf means the prolongation of the landed territories rocks we are like we are on the land we are like we are all uh, staying in delhi so delhi is on the rock which is a very solid rock and thereafter we have sedimentation we have a thick layer of soil and thereafter now we have uh, our homes uh, over it uh, so uh, this is a rock you know that very hard rock which if you go to the uh, sea coast then you'll find that uh, after the point where the land and sea both they meet together after that point what happens that the rock where we are that rock goes down and then it it is there it does not disappear altogether so it is there it goes down and therefore if suppose if you have experienced scuba diving then you will find that even down uh, the ocean there is a rock where the you know at, at the bottom sometimes even fisheries go and then take their food like that so uh, you see that likewise what i was telling you that the theoretical justification of continental shelf in law was that it is not simply a geographical a small area of uh, continental shelf but it is the natural prolongation of the rock over which a nation is uh, uh, located so suppose if we talk of indian sub peninsula and uh, we will find that this uh, this rock of indian peninsula is going down to a great uh, uh, depth in the ocean and therefore suppose if you just take this example then after this continental uh, rise where the continental rise uh, comes to an end thereafter it is a uh, abyssal depth it is called abyssal depth where the where the slope is even more steep and thereafter you may have heard that in the ocean there are uh, trenches and in those trenches even uh, there is one trench where even the whole himalaya that, that can be you know uh, submerged so this is how i just wanted to tell you about the concept because this concept you must understand in the exam suppose if you just write okay continental shelf means the just geographical meaning of shelf it will be uh, not correct so you have to understand the concept of uh, legal concept of continental shelf and then you must look at uh, this article 76 of the un convention the law of sea and then only you will understand that what does it mean what is the meaning of continental shelf it says continental shelf of a coastal state comprises the seabed and subsoil of the submarine areas that extend beyond its territorial sea throughout the natural prolongation this is natural the, the landed territory the rock of the landed territory is naturally prolonged and therefore it is called uh, you know wherever it is it will be found it will be continental margin to the outer edge of the continental margin so suppose if we say about a continent so it's like continent africa asia these are all continents so in asia we have like south asia like that so so continental margin so up to that very point you see that a nation uh, is going to claim or then it says because sometimes what may happen that on the same continent there are many countries and then uh, many coastal states so in that case it what it say or to a distance of 200 nautical miles from the baselines baselines the concept of baseline i have already told you what is the meaning of baseline i have told you if you do not remember i just say you that uh, the uh, baselines are those lines which are uh, which are which are formed after joining the points at the low tide uh, points uh, when the coastline is normal and if the coastline is uh, very di uh, different and it is uh, it is somewhere uh, indented uh, deeply and uh, somewhere it is having a fringe of islands in such cases what may happen that straight line method that can be also adopted so just to refresh your mind i'll just say that 
This is the meaning of baseline, and therefore baselines are always important to be understood. So Article 76 says that uh, the natural uh, prolongation of the landed territory up to that point, continental shelf of a country is there. Or the continental shelf uh, extends to at least 200 nautical miles from the baselines from which the breadth is measured, where the outer edge of the continental margin does not extend up to that distance. So suppose if there is a country which is a small one and then uh, it is uh, not having uh, this much of continental margin, in that case what will happen, that law says, even then 200 nautical miles should be given to that country. So, uh, uh, so what I was telling you that uh, this uh, concept you must properly understand. And thereafter, what I will tell you that what are the rights of the coastal state and of the third states on the continental shelf. Uh, but before coming to this rights of coastal states and the third states on continental shelf, I will also tell you that in Article 76, what I have told you that 200 nautical miles is the minimum continental shelf which is uh, now given uh, to the coastal states. And then suppose uh, if there is a difficulty uh, in giving this much of thing, then there is also another formula which is isobath formula. And this isobath formula is that where the depth is 2500 meters, from that point, uh, you have to go further uh, towards the ocean uh, for 100 nautical miles. So that is also one option. So suppose if there is no agreement on 200 nautical miles uh, from the baseline, then you can also have this option, which is the, 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 the what is called depth option. That from the depth, a particular from the, that particular depth, you have to, you can go up to 100 nautical miles. So the particular depth is 2,500 meters. So you see that from 200 meters in 1945, in 1982, what was the claim? 2,500 meters and thereafter even beyond it, 100 nautical miles beyond it. And there is a third option to uh, also calculate uh, the breadth of continental shelf. And the third option is uh, the maxima in any case, and the maxima in any case, even when the continental margin goes, uh, goes uh, beyond 350 nautical miles, in such cases, the rule is that the maximum breadth of continental shelf will not be more than 350 nautical miles from the baseline. So this is all given in Article 76. If you, I'll just show you that Article 76, you'll see that from, the, from this place, 200 nautical miles you have already found. And then you'll find that in article, and then in paragraph four uh, and five, you'll find these rules. You see, this is this is called isobath rule. So 100 nautical miles from 2500 meter isobath, and then it will not in any case go beyond 350 nautical miles from the baselines from which the breadth of a territorial sea is measured. And then in article uh, paragraph six, it says that the outer limit shall not exceed 350 nautical miles again. So all these uh, rules, Article 76, uh, Rule 1, Rule 4, 5, all these are the options which are given to the coastal state uh, to calculate uh, the breadth of the continental shelf. I will also discuss about the delimitation uh, 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 methods, What, how the continental shelf can be delimited uh, if there is no agreement. Uh, so in such cases, I will uh, come to the cases just in few minutes, but uh, the main thing that I wanted to make you understand at this point of time, that you must know about the legal concept of continental shelf very clearly. And then second, that you must know again, uh, the, the baseline method, the, the low water line method, and uh, because the, the baseline is will be the same even for calculating the breadth of continental shelf. Now, apart from these things, if you have understood these things, what I will uh, now share with you is that what are the rights of the coastal states over the continental shelf? Because as a student of law, 
uh, you must be more interested in knowing about the rights and duties of the postal state as well as of the third states. So, uh, as far as the rights of the coastal states over continental shelf are concerned, uh, you will have to uh, go uh, to Article 77 of the UN Convention on the Law of Sea. And it says that uh, the, so the coastal state uh, has the sovereign right to not only to explore, but also to exploit uh, and conserve and also to manage the natural resources which are found in the continental shelf area. So you see Article 77, it says, coastal state exercises sovereign rights for the purpose of exploring and exploiting its natural resources. So uh, the sovereign rights are not unlimited. Sovereign rights are not the same so kind of sovereign rights which a nation has over the landed territory. In the continental shelf area, it will be a limited uh, sovereign rights. And what is the kind of limitation? The limitation is that over the continental shelf area, uh, the sovereign right is only for the exploring and exploiting the natural resources in the continental shelf. Right? And thereafter, you'll find that uh, what is the uh, other uh, uh, rights and duties it says in Article 78, you'll find that the rights of the coastal state does not affect the legal status of the superjacent waters or of the airspace above those waters. So what does it mean? That the third states will enjoy the rights of the flying over the air of the continental shelf. They will also enjoy uh, any kind of, you know, like uh, sea uh, travel. So super descent waters, over the waters, they can go and uh, nobody will stop them. Uh, unless, uh, again, it's a violation of the, some kind of rights of the coastal state. And I have told you that suppose if they are going to exploit uh, the resources and then suppose if they have made some kind of artificial island for that and then they have made certain rules to abide by, then obviously those will have to be complied with. But normally, uh, the coastal states' rights over the superjacent water, uh, sorry, the third state's rights over the coastal, uh, over the superjacent waters and over the airspace, that uh, is intact in the continent itself. Uh, so you'll find that uh, uh, these are some of the things which you must know. And then Article 79 again talks about the rights of the third state. It says that the submarine cables and pipelines in the continental shelf that can be laid down by the third states because it is uh, not going to uh, harm the interest of the coastal state unless again the coastal state is uh, going to explore and exploit the natural resources which are there in the, in, in the area. And further Article 80 uh, says that the coastal state can also create or make artificial islands, installations and structures on the continental shelf. Now, if you look at all these articles which are there, you'll find that here lies the rights and duties of the coastal state uh, over the area. And because of the fact that the coastal state is even 200 nautical miles in the seabed, and uh, thereafter, the coastal state is given the right, sovereign right to explore and to exploit its natural resources, uh, then uh, in, in such cases, that right of the coastal state must be agreed to. Uh, but suppose if the coastal state does not explore or exploit uh, the resources uh, in the continental shelf uh, of uh, under its possession, in that case, paragraph 2 of Article 7, 77 says that uh, if the coastal state does not explore the continental shelf or it does not exploit its natural resource, no one may undertake these activities without the express consent of the coastal state. It means that uh, other, part, other states, they can explore in the continental shelf of others, but with one condition that they will have to take the consent of the coastal state and that to the express consent of the coastal state. So coastal state uh, is having the first right, but if they will not do anything in such case, other countries they may want 
to explore. In such case, they will have to take the express consent of uh, the of the coastal state. And then, if you find that what is the meaning of natural resources, I told you that the coastal state has uh, the sovereign right to explore and exploit the natural resources. What is the meaning of natural resources? Paragraph four of Article seventy seven says that the natural resources consist of the mineral and other non-living resources of the seabed and subsoil together with living organisms belonging to such sedentary species uh, which are which are immobile or which cannot move except in constant physical contact with the seabed or subsoil so it means normally uh, uh, the the non-living resources of the seabed and subsoil that is covered in the natural resources so living uh, beings living resources uh, living species they are not covered except those living species which are normally immobile so which can't travel on its own unless they can travel only uh, with the physical contact with the seabed and subsoil so those only kind of uh, uh, living species can be uh, exploited and explored by the coastal state otherwise uh, mainly the non living resources can be because normally what happens that uh, beyond this uh, this uh, 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 around uh, 50 uh, meter of depth and 100 meters of depth and uh, normally what happens that uh, the the flora and fauna uh, gradually uh, starts to diminish so uh, in such uh, depths, it will be very difficult to find any living things. So normally, so uh, so it means that whatever things are there in the seabed uh, up to that depth, uh, maybe three thousand meters depth, maybe so such kind of depth in such depth, whatever is found uh, as a natural resource that can be exploited by the coastal state. So these are some of the things that I wanted to tell you about, uh, and then. I will tell you now about the uh, delimitation. What is the meaning of delimitation? I have already told you because in the territorial waters, I, I told you about uh, the delimitation uh, of the territorial waters, territorial sea. And I have discussed the case of Anglo-Norwegian fisheries case. And uh, while I was dealing with contiguous zone, I again dealt with the Republic of uh, Italy versus Union of India case, uh, Italian Marines uh, in short or uh, what you can say. Uh, so these cases I have already dealt with and uh, now uh, what I will deal with a delimitation of continental shelf. So uh, as far as the delimitation of continental shelf is considered, uh, it is a very very uh, tough uh, thing because uh, it is very difficult to uh, measure. Uh, the depth uh, in the ocean and then also to fix the boundary lines <clears throat> and uh, thirdly uh, not only that but uh, the resources in the seabed and ocean floor uh, in such depths are very uh, costly and very important uh, so many nations they fight for it and therefore disputes uh, arise over the sharing of uh, the resources of the continental shelf and therefore this UN convention on the law of sea it has been very very successful in dealing with such possibilities and therefore if you look at the method of delimitation which is there uh, it says that uh, in article 50 in article 83 of uh, this convention you'll find that it says that uh, to properly delimit uh, the continental shelf what you need you need agreement and it says that delimitation uh, shall be affected by agreement so agreement is important if there is an agreement between the states and they are parties to un convention on the law of sea uh, then they must agree because they are all parties so they will agree according to the rules which are there in the un convention and then it further says that uh, in order to achieve an equitable solution you know so agreement should be not only uh, just an Kind of agreement on the basis of UN Convention Law of Sea, which says that 200 nautical miles and then maximum of 350 nautical miles, etc. But also, it must, there must be a solution which is equitable. So, what is the meaning of that? And uh, uh, 
uh, so for that we will try to understand uh, some of the cases but just i will uh, give you a look of uh, article 83 paragraph 1 which is very very important it says that what is the method of delimitation it says that you must agree first and agreement must be uh, in order to achieve equitable solution and the, here comes the difficulty even the difficulty comes at the level of any agreement between the nations uh, particularly in those cases where uh, over the same uh, rock formation there are uh, many countries adjacent countries opposite countries so in all such cases the problem uh, will definitely arise and one of the problem which arose even before this UN Convention on the Law of the Sea that was agreed, that is North Sea Continental Shelf case. Uh, this is a very important case. If you are going to attempt this question in your exam, this will be the case which is which has to be dealt with uh, by you, and you must properly understand because uh, the judgment which was rendered in this case that laid the foundation stone of many other things uh, which are mentioned and which are elaborately dealt with in the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. <coughs> so, uh, to have a proper understanding of the North Sea Continental Shelf case, I'll just show you one map. And here you will find that, you see, this is the case North Sea uh, Continental Shelf case in which there were three countries involved. On the one hand was Germany and the other hand and the two countries, Netherlands and Denmark. And you see this is the uh, map, geographical map of uh, the North Sea. This is North Sea. And over the right, this is Denmark. Uh, and then uh, in between is Germany. And then in the left is Netherlands. So if you find uh, this map, you'll find that what is the difficulty here? But the difficulty lies in the, in, in the, in the, uh, in the shape of the coasts and the problem lies with the fact that uh, what is the length of the coast and also sometimes the problem lies that how to measure uh, this uh, baseline and uh, therefore you see this uh, if the, you see that i have told you in the delimitation chapter on territorial waters what i have told you that the direction of uh, the measurement that will be uh, towards the coast so uh, or towards the direction of the coast so if this is the direction of the coast this is the direction of the coast so this will be like uh, this will be like this so uh, baseline will be so from baseline if this is the baseline so this will be so this will be uh, the, the angle in which uh, the length the breadth of the territorial waters as well as continental shelf that will be measured. Uh, likewise, if uh, this is the direction, if this is the direction of uh, the Denmark coastal line, then what will happen that likewise, uh, likewise this will suppose if this is the uh, low water line or baseline, from here what will happen that you will have to measure uh, the, the different maritime zones. So in this case, suppose uh, the problem was that Germany, in this case, Germany did not want equidistance method uh, to be applied in the delimitation of its continental shelf. You'll say, you'll ask me that why, del uh, why delimitation according to equidistance formula? The answer is that in this uh, 1958 Geneva Convention, you see this 1958 Geneva Convention on Continental Shelf, where these two tests were laid down. In this convention, in 1958 Geneva Convention, Article 6 uh, was there. And Article 6 uh, stipulated that the formula to delimit the continental shelf between two adjacent or opposite countries will be called equidistance method. Equidistance method is again very simple to understand. It means that suppose if a room has to be divided into, uh, into a into two uh, persons uh, following the formula of equidistance. It means that uh, both these persons would have to take uh, as many steps where they will meet together uh, coming from opposite directions. So uh, likewise, equidistance method is a method which is a, 
very for very mathematical method and very uh, systematic method and uh, the and it is very uh, objective method however in this case germany did not want to apply equidistance method because if equidistance and uh, and uh, the 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 method by which uh, you take the uh, the the uh, the you take the starting point of the baseline from the direction of the coast then what will happen that uh, germany will get uh, this much of continental shelf you see this a2 this a2 point this a2 point and this triangle shape so a3 a2 to a3 and to a1 so this will be uh, this will be uh, this will, this will the a2 will be the median point and uh, this will be only the continental shelf of uh, germany but germany did not want it because germany said that look uh, uh, because germany had a dispute and germany did not want it because first of all germany said that we are not signatory to 1958 geneva convention on continental shelf and therefore it will not be applicable uh, equidistance formula is not applicable and secondly it said that even if we were the parties even then uh, equidistance formula is not a formula which gives any equitable solution here and uh, germany wanted uh, the application of some kind of relevant circumstances what uh, circumstances really relevant uh, germany wanted that those circumstances must also be counted whenever delimitation has to be done and uh, what germany said that in germany's case you look at when it the matter went to the international court of justice germany prayed that tort ships uh, you see the the kind of coastline here you see this is north sea but then when you come towards germany you will find that this is a concave uh, kind of uh, shape of the coastline so what germany wanted that in such cases where the concave coastline is there uh, such countries have a tendency to get less of the continental shelf because in such cases what will happen that if you follow the rule that we have to follow the the direction of the coastline then obviously the country which is located at the base of the concave of the coast and uh, that will get the low, lowest kind of uh, continental shelf so what did, what germany in, in uh, effect said uh, prayed to the court that let it let us not only apply this uh, median point line following the equidistance method but we must also apply uh, the relevant circumstances where you have to uh, to some, somehow mitigate the harshness of the rule by which you have uh, applied only equidistance formula and then the result is that getting less of the continental shelf even when germany has a uh, longer coastline uh, in terms of length so you see that uh, uh, when this matter went to the court and finally the decision came in 1969 after a lot of efforts by the international court of justice because that was the first case uh, which was decided uh, by international court of justice relating to maritime affairs because in those uh, times it was very difficult because only geneva convention on continental shelf was there and uh, uh, if you look at the judgment which is given in your case material if you look at the judgment uh, you'll find that uh, in this judgment uh, the judges were also deeply divided and uh, you see that it was a uh, 11 to 6 uh, uh, kind of voting uh, so 11 judges voted in favor of the uh, judgment and six voted uh, against it so it was uh, hugely divided because at that moment of time the law was not very clear and it was very difficult to apply the equity uh, principle so look at just you have to look at uh, uh, your uh, case material you try to understand uh, what were the arguments what i will tell you that the crux of germany's contention was that equitable grounds must include the configuration of the what kind of shape of the coast is there? Whether it is concave, whether it is convex, uh, then the length of the coast. If a country is having a longer coastline, uh, then it should be given more uh, in the continental shelf. And then it talked about the natural prolongation of the landed territory into and under the sea. Uh, and then it says that it is not a party to the Geneva Convention. But on the other hand, Netherlands and Denmark 
they wanted on the continental shelf by applying equidistance formula as enshrined in Article 6, Paragraph 2 of 1958 Geneva Convention. And uh, if you look at this judgment, uh, this judgment was uh, in favor of Germany. Uh, even when many prominent persons, they were involved in uh, arguing for Netherlands and Denmark. Professor Humphrey Waldock, he was from Oxford, and uh, Professor Lauterpacht, he was from Cambridge. If you go today to um, Cambridge University, you'll find that even today, Lauterpacht Center of International Law is very, very famous. So uh, these people were there, you know, Humphrey Waldock and Lauterpacht, uh, they were the councils of Denmark and Netherlands. And uh, Denmark's uh, coastline, uh, is having 1700 kilometers and Netherlands coastline is only 450 kilometers and Germany's coastline was 2400 kilometers. So uh, even then what happened that Germany was given lesser uh, continental shelf area if uh, equidistance formula could be applied. So uh, Netherlands and Denmark particularly emphasized upon the customary nature of the treaty rule. What was the treaty rule? Treaty rule was 1958 Geneva Convention. And uh, the treaty rule was equidistance method. So what Netherlands and Denmark contended uh, in a sense that uh, the cust it has become customary. You know, it means that even when Germany has not signed uh, this 1958 Continental Shelf Convention, even then Germany is bound by it. Uh, but Germany said that no, first of all, we did not sign. And second, that even some countries who have signed it, they have also not signed it without any kind of putting of conditions. So some country has given some condition, other country might have given some other condition. So whenever any standard is not absolute, you can't say that this kind of standard uh, has become a customary kind of norm or standard all over the world. Uh, therefore, Germany in this case, uh, perhaps this may be the and this may be the reason why now I will when I will move on to international tribunal for the law of the sea. Uh, perhaps uh, this may be I don't uh, think that this might be a very strong reason, but one of the reasons might be have been uh, to establish uh, international tribunal for the law of the sea in Germany uh, was the fact that Germany had won this case and Germany was influential in making of the third UN convention on the law of the sea. You see. Uh, that the judgment when it, the judgment came 11 judges were in favor of uh, the relevant circumstances rule not 11 judges were not in favor of the mechanical application of uh, this uh, uh, equidistance method 11 judges were in favor of the application of not only a mechanical formula but also arriving at an equitable solution and equitable solution uh, if you want to arrive at then Germany's contention that uh, let us have, let us mitigate the harshness of the equidistance formula that must also be there and therefore what happened that in this case ICJ partially upheld Germany's contention Justice Bustamante of Peru he delivered the majority opinion and what he said that relevant circumstances of Germany what were the relevant circumstances what was the shape of the coast of Germany what was the length of the coast and what was the kind of uh, the natural features of the landed territory of Germany which were going inside uh, the sea uh, when uh, when this matter came to the court and finally hap it happened that the, the order came and this order uh, incorporated and uh, it uh, propagated a new kind of rule which was thereafter called equidistance relevant circumstances rule. Equidistance relevant circumstance. Germany wanted relevant circumstances to be taken into consideration. So uh, what happened that if you look at this judgment uh, in, uh, in the International Court of Justice, many famous people were there and as judges. And if you look at those names of the judges, Philip Jason, uh, was the judge from US. You might have heard about Philip Jessup, uh, International Moot Court Competition. So Philip Jessup was the judge here in this case and he had given the majority opinion. 
uh, Justice Fitz Morris from UK, he was also there. And Fitz Morris is also has been considered a very influential judge. And thereafter, there were uh, judges from Pakistan, Jafrullah Khan was there. And uh, thereafter, judge from Nigeria was there, uh, Onyamo. And then uh, there were uh, other judges, like from Lebanon, there was Justice Amun. Uh, and the dissenting opinion uh, was delivered by a judge from Japan, Justice Tanaka, and then Justice Lax, and then uh, Justice Koretsky, etc. So uh, you must uh, try to uh, properly understand this case.